I mean, you would swear they're two different guns, two different ammos, but it's just a muzzle device. Just a difference in where that blast, that concussion, and those gases are going. It's also kind of what's being done with them. Like a, a, a brake is using those. You can see the shapes <clears throat> of those baffles. They're redirecting gases. Mm -hmm. What is up, everybody? I have Mr. Ruben Alexson across from me today. Repeat guest. It's been a while, though, Ruben. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. Good to have you back. Thanks we're for having me. We're, absolutely. We're going to talk today. We're going to talk about muzzle brakes. You oftentimes see them on uh, hunting rifles. You see them on uh, all sorts of rifles. Ruben, you do a ton of competitive shooting. You've got all sorts of brakes and compensators. I've been called a compensator. Yeah. I think that's different, though. Uh, uh, yeah. We've got a bunch of them on the table here. I've got a, uh, a rifle in front of me. Um, happens to be a, a Weatherby Mark V Backcountry 2.0, and it's got a brake on it. Mm -hmm. Flyweight rifle. I think it's like coming in at like five and a half pounds. It's in there, 6.5 RPM. So she's kind of uh, she's a little hot and snappy. Yep. Probably I, I wouldn't want to shoot it without a brake. You probably wouldn't. Uh, you know, I mean, we were doing some recoil calculations. I don't have them off the top of my head, but it was like... Kind of like almost like I want to say it was like three hundred wind meg. Yeah, it's probably realm, not far off that. You know, so enough, and I've shot enough three hundred winds and three hundred shorts, unbraked that I don't find it like super offensive. But with this rifle being just like you know, pretty darn light. Yeah, it's flyweight. It it tames it a little bit, and I think you know shoot. I think I'll I think I'll shoot this rifle better with it braked. Um, admittedly, I don't love shooting brakes. Yeah, the, well, they have their pluses and minuses, for sure. Yeah. And, and I look at a rifle like that, you know, to kind of kick off the conversation. Well, you know, we always hear, like, when you're when you're in that moment, you're lined up on that animal, or you're going to take that shot. People always say, like, I didn't, I didn't even feel the kick. I didn't even feel the recoil. Well, if you're going to practice with it, you still are going to feel the recoil, mm -hmm. right? And so the one thing that I do like about, you know, recoil mit mitigation devices are – that they do allow the gun to be more shootable, mm -hmm. makes it more enjoyable so you can practice with it. And if, you know, if you're going to go out and take it hunting and you don't want that muzzle brake, that blast, like don't take the muzzle brake with, but practice with it because it's going to, it's going to make that practice much more enjoyable, mm -hmm. at least from a recoil standpoint. Yeah. And I think you will, even if you have a lot of experience shooting high recoiling rifles, um, I talked to enough shooters like you, Scott Parks, other people, and they're just like, you're going to shoot a lighter recoiling r rifle better. You know what I mean? Like, it's, the, you know, like, say, you're less likely to develop bad habits, you know, a flinch, yeah. things like that. So they, they can they can be hand, very handy, very helpful, and enhance the shootability of a rifle, um, not without maybe some potential downsides. Yep, Right. Sure. So I think let's, let's talk about... Do you want to talk about the different categories of yeah let's like kind of let's get some definitions in play here because yeah. there's a lot there's a lot of nuance to these things you yeah know? And, and some of them take more than one use too i mean th they have different purposes for them right you know uh, like you have kind of like a category of like you know competition muzzle brakes um those are we're not super concerned about the noise or the blast right like it's strictly based on performance of keeping that muzzle flat on like you know, an AR, like a, a three-gun rifle or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that might be really similar, but also different from a brake made for a PRS rifle. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be different from a, you know, a muzzle device like this where it's a suppressor adapter. You know, it doubles as a suppressor, like mm -hmm. quick detach, quick attach thing. Um, and then you have, you know, compensators versus muzzle brakes. What, what's the difference there? Right. Right. Yeah, if you had to kind of put it in a nutshell, a compensator um, is going to account, it's going to try and mitigate that muzzle rise. Right. Right. You think like old school machine guns, like one of the first ones was like on a Tommy gun, right? Um, to kind of like fight that high rate of fire, the muzzle climbing, like you'll see on a compensator, something that maybe is more classified as a compensator, it's going to have some sort of like top ports um, that are going to help that muzzle rise but their their main purpose isn't necessarily recoil mitigation. It's making sure that that muzzle rise. Um, and then when we look at like a flash hider, that's totally different. Now there's you know flash hiding 
compensators. There's there's muzzle brakes that have, um, you know, reduced signature, but you know it kind of can't do all the jobs. It you kind of you're gonna pick one that does something really well, and maybe some of the other aspects of it not as well. But if we look at like like an Area Four One Nine um, Hellfire competition, this is made to keep to mitigate recoil, uh, so that. I can watch my trace and watch my impact if I need to make a correction. Right. That doesn't have any top ports. Right. Yeah. Now, there there is some design features of this that help mitigate that muzzle rise, but the main job is keeping that recoil flat, um, straight into your shoulder, but also minimizing it. Mm-hmm. Um, this one doesn't take into account the guys next to you, right? It's right. going to be pretty loud. But to the shooter, it's not much different than if you were shooting... Uh, just a, a rifle with a standard muzzle. Okay. But that's that's different from something that's made to be a suppressor adapter. Uh, and that's right. different from something that's made to be a flash hiding muzzle brake, like this PWS. So th- there are a lot of differences in, like, you know, how how they what they're intended to do as their primary focus, um, what kind of gun they were intended to go on, um, and then... You know, we could even we can even go into like some of the devices that might help us um, mitigate some of the negative aspects of a muzzle brake, like a like a blast deflector. So we can we can dive into all that and go into all the different uses and. Yeah, I mean, it seems like like so many things. It's almost like the, you know the classic question we get here a lot, like, "Why well, need a rifle scope for deer hunting?" It's like, okay, like. What kind or, of deer hunting? Yeah, or, or what's the best rifle scope? Well, yeah. what, are, what are you going to use it what for? What are you using it it's for? Like, what's the best, best muzzle brake? Well, what are you going to use it for? Or, yep. oh, actually, I don't need a muzzle brake. I need a compensator, mm-hmm. you know, or, yep. uh, and like, so and you got a couple things here I didn't even know about. You right? kind of kicked it off and said rifles, but like, when I think of like, um, like the custom 2011 competition pistol sure. I shoot, that has a compensator on the end. Right. Those ports go straight up. Yeah. There are no side ports. It's not a muzzle brake. It's a compensator to keep that muzzle flat as I'm shooting. Yeah, you're not and worried. You're not necessarily worried about recoil. You're just trying to. You're yep. firing a lot of rounds downrange very rapidly and exactly. wanting that muzzle to stay flat so you can stay on target. So like I've shot this comp uh, a lot or this muzzle brake, but it it has certain aspects that lend it to kind of be both. Um, so when you look at it's got these this big blast chamber which is going to take a lot of that initial brunt of that mm-hmm. that gas the gas is expanding uh, and then it has three ch- three ports yeah they kind of progressively it's like big a little bit smaller and then a little bit smaller mm-hmm. yeah so from a first look you would look at this and that's a muzzle brake right yeah. there's no top ports but then when we look at it from this angle we can see that the top the profile is actually opened Mm-hmm. So that more gas is allowed to expand upward, keeping the muzzle flat. Uh, this one isn't necessarily as focused on reducing recoil to my shoulder as much as it is designed to mitigate that muzzle rise. So it kind of does both jobs. Mm-hmm. But the purpose of like a, a comp for a three-gun rifle uh, or a brake, wh- wh- whichever aspect is more, more relevant in that design, um, that's for my follow-up shot. That's for that quick follow-up shot as I'm, you know, putting two into paper or shooting offhand steel, I can have faster transitions. Um, because on that rifle, there's just not a lot of recoil to begin with. Right. But there's a lot of muzzle rise if it's just a standard, you know, A2 flash hider or something like that. Um, and then this one is also uh, kind of designed with that, like that three-gun rifle in mind. Um, What's that one? This one's made by Coda Evolution. It's actually a titanium design. Um Ooh. Solid titanium. Um, but that also has, like, those three ports, as you can see, those three three chambers. Or but, wait. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, right. Nope. So we're going up here. I only see two. And then those top ports are the compensating portion of it. So that's going to help keep it flat. These are going to mitigate recoil. Um, and then it does have, uh, let's see here, one on each on the right side. Okay. Which, for a right-handed shooter... As that gun wants to recoil up and to the right, that's going to help it stay down and to the Wait, left. Wait, hold on a sec. Interesting. Just the one on the right side. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that they made right and left-handed. Uh, so as, I, as I'm holding that rifle and I'm shooting, yeah, I'm supported on this side of the gun. On the left side of the gun is supported. 
So my tendency as I shoot is as I'm trying to keep that gun stable and flat, if I have um, <clears throat> equal pressure down and equal pressure reducing recoil, I'm going to tend to push that gun to the right. That port is actually driving the gun into my support hand a little bit. Interesting. Can you have you can you notice the difference? You can. If you shoot enough of them and you you spend enough time behind them, you can notice a little bit of difference. Um, but there's uh, actually one of the one of the more popular three gun rifle um, muzzle devices is, was made by Armalite, and mm -hmm. um, still really really popular when you see a lot of people using them. It's actually tunable. So it has um, the instructions that come with that allow you to put these set screws in, and then you actually drill a hole in that set screw to your desired diameter based on shooting it. So you would actually take it out, mount it to the rifle, shoot it, and then increase those port sizes so that it's coming and driving that recoil into your hand so that as you're shooting those fast transitions and those fast follow-up shots, the gun is seemingly staying very flat and on target. That seems to me to be for the person that really is fam so familiar with their rifle setup and how they want it to be that they're like, you know. We're in the, we're kind of into a portion of, when we talk about these things where we're not changing our gear every time. Like this yeah. is kind of a thing you see guys like Josh Fralick, um, people like Jerry, like they're not changing their equipment necessarily every year. I think I've watched Josh shoot the same muzzle brake on his rifle for like the last five years or something and it while you might change the orientation of it a little bit to tune it for that whatever you know maybe the balance of the gun changes as a new type of handguard comes out or a different butt stock or something but they're not changing like the fundamental the whole rifle every year no i mean there's so much um you know it's like the classic you know beware the man with one gun mm -hmm. right like knows mm -hmm. how to use it and there's you know, you start changing things, and then, like, maybe you do something with your shooting style or whatever, how, anything, you know, then change, yeah, I could see where that would be problematic. And you, you can know? even go, if we were doing, like, a demo and we were showing a customer, um, you know, one of our rifles, we'll bring it with to a shoot, and we'll set it up, and they're not seeing that that same thing that I see when I shoot it. They're like, I don't get it. Like, doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. I could even just say, like, all right, let's change your hand position a little bit on the gun, and all of a sudden it's a different shooting experience. Yeah. So it, it does get to the point where it's a little bit more specific. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and then you, you brought a couple things here that uh, a blast diverter? Yeah, well, you know, when we Are started, we there yet? I don't know. We, like, we can I, go I was, there. I was curious about it. Finish yeah. what you're finish what you're we'll tease we'll tease the blast diverter. Well if we were kind of talking a little bit more of these like specialized, you know, so these specialized comps and, and breaks, um, that doesn't really necessarily apply. But we look at this and, and I kinda of mentioned it before, like three gun rifle, think about, you know, a, a competition carbine, something like that. Um, we're not as concerned about uh, it being multifunctional. We just need it to do that job really well. Right. Think like a, they're not too concerned about how well uh, a drag car can go through the mud. So weird. I was thinking a, a dr that's drag really, racer. Yes. Yeah, it's like it's got one job. It like, does one job. But when we does start, it really well. Yeah, and it does it really well. But when we start talking about, um, you know, maybe uh, maybe we want it to have, you know, kind of a multifunction or multi-purpose, we would start to look at something like this. This is a dead air. Uh, muzzle brake mm -hmm. um with uh some ports in it right that i'm not sure i'm i'm not i've not like done a deep dive into the design of why these ports are here my guess is that they're um more vent ports uh because it is still a suppressor adapter so it's probably diverting a little bit more gases um in, into that initial blast chamber of the suppressor okay but when we look at this this is made so that i can take a suppressor and quick attach it or quick detach it um but it's also a really good standalone muzzle brake um i've shot this one quite a bit as you can see there's a lot of uh a lot of schmutz on there um, right but uh it, it works really well as, as a as a muzzle brake um but then this portion back here is where uh the locking lugs of the suppressor will come lock in and then tighten over i think this is the chemo um adapter gotcha um, and then does that integrate only with their suppressors? Is that like, uh, or does it integrate like if you're like, oh, I've got a 
X-Brand suppressor that'll fit on it too. So they do make adapters that will thread into the rear portion of a lot of suppressors. So they might have their own quick attach, quick detach mechanism, mm -hmm. but then they also make um, a device that will, like with uh, Silencer Co. Omega, you can actually take the, the end cap off where you would switch that suppressor from being like a, a quick detach, quick attach to a direct thread. They actually make a component that threads in to that direct thread portion um, where the adapter would thread in that will allow you to use this uh, muzzle brake or flash hider um, with that different brand of suppressor. And that's becoming more and more popular too now. You're seeing that with um, brands like Q, uh, Griffin, um, and, and several others. Gotcha. I mean, yeah, it's, it's so insane. The... They're all similar, but they're all different, and mm -hmm. they all are cut just a little bit different. With I feel like you know a little bit different, you know even yeah different angle to the ports. Um, well, when we talk about how how some you know some muzzle brakes or flash hiders or compensators might attach to the gun, um, <clears throat> with a lot of them, you know especially with compensators and muzzle brakes, they do need to be timed. So you think you you take this, you thread it onto your barrel. If it indexes sideways, really anything other than the orientation that it was intended to right. to index at, we need something that's going to allow us to do that. So most of these that are <coughs> intended to be orientated this way, mm -hmm. you know, upright, will come with this like an assortment of shims, or at the very least a crush washer. Mm -hmm. um, a crush washer, you know, is not ideal or optimal if you're going to adapt a suppressor to it because it can allow that that muzzle device to kind of go off axis a little bit and okay. you kind of increase the risk of a baffle strike nobody likes that nope uh that's not a good thing um and that can be serious too a friend of mine just had a, a baffle strike on a suppressor that actually ended up breaking his collarbone um so so yes you if they include shims don't swap out a crush washer yeah. Use the shims, get it timed, and most of them actually will have a little diagram in the instructions that say, like, do you need a quarter turn? Then it's this shim and this shim, and the shims are in different thicknesses. Gotcha. Um, so make sure you're following the instructions on that uh, if you are going to use a device that needs to be timed. Um, some of them, if, if you're not intending to use it you know, as a suppressor adapter, uh, you can get away with using a crush washer. Like, I know this JP came with this crush washer, um, but... You can also um, you can also time this directly to the barrel. So on on more of like the um, like maybe a, maybe you're having a, a rifle built and you want a, a muzzle device attached. Maybe you're doing a pin and welded like a 14.5 barrel and you need to get to the overall 16. Um, you would have that then timed to the barrel, making sure that your overall length uh, is within the law, uh, and then. Uh, they would actually take like your barrel and figure out where that suppressor needs to line up. And so when uh, the gunsmith is attaching this, they'll actually, <coughs> sometimes they'll have to make uh, like an outside diameter adjustment on the barrel, you know, take a little bit of material off. Um, but oftentimes what they'll just, they'll need to do is just remove a little material on the back side of, this, of the muzzle device okay. that will allow it to time properly. Now, this one, obviously, this is an AR barrel. We can see the gas port is up here, so that's kind of our 12 o'clock position. And then this muzzle device uh, I got to use with this barrel, it's going to need to be pinned and welded. Um, <clears throat> but as you can see, that times very cleanly. Mm -hmm. It's just not timed in the right orientation. So my gunsmith will need to take this, remo remove enough material so I can get another approximately three quarters of a turn. You can see it's on its side right now. So I will need to make sure that it gets to this position. But as you can kind of see, once that's once that's attached, there's it's almost seamless. I was gonna say it's pretty seamless. And yeah. And so we that's that's and, th and that would be a situation where where you're like pretty committed you're committed to that you know that one um yeah and and you know like this is where this is where if you're at an event you would you would try a combination out you know hopefully the manufacturer would have something where you can try it out or you could try it on a combination where like a 16 inch barrel you could thread it on see how you like the recoil impulse and then decide if that's the the one that you want to go with or ask 
ask somebody who's got that combination already and using it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, once once you're there, I mean, everything even down to your barrel nut and usually your gas block are pretty much a that's a set decision. Mm-hmm. If you were like, let's say you had a buddy and, and he was running that particular one, you're like, oh, I'm kind of interested in that. Um, and you had, let's say, we'll say not the same but similar setups. Yep. Would you be able to discern enough from shooting your buddy's rifle? Be like, oh, yeah, I like the way that acts. I want that one. Or is it going to be so specific to your rifle? It could be pretty specific. A lot of times the manufacturers will know that, though. You know, they'll, you'll say, hey, I'm using it on a full mass system or a, or a low mass system. Um, they'll, they'll make recommendations. But I think for the most part, most of that adjustment in how the gun feels is done in the gas system and the buffer system. Yeah. So at least on an AR, that's, yeah. that's where I would probably focus more on. That, that break is going to be really good on most combinations. It's just you're going to fine-tune your buffer, fine-tune you know, your, the mass of your operating system. That's where, that's, and it's kind of an illustration of like, it's an example of like how complex some of these setups get. Uh, but most of the time, the manufacturer will, will know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about. I'm trying to go through my. Oh, little, my little I know what we can talk about. What timing? So we yes. kind of just talked a little bit about um, timing the 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 break onto the barrel. Um, that could be on a bolt action, a gas gun, really really any setup, right? Sure. Um, so we have kind of like our crush washer. That's that's a traditional, really quick way to do it. Doesn't really require a gunsmith, but it's not very. It's it's not a custom. It's kind of a one size fits all. Um, we could go to something like this. Um, I think this is a Patriot Valley. I'm, I'm, uh, I might be wrong on that. But this actually has an integrated timing uh, <coughs> nut on it. Okay. So this is a, a break made for like PRS type shooting, precision rifle shooting. Um, uh, this one is actually a 6.5 bore. Okay. So uh, it's not it's not a, like a universal. You wouldn't want to throw this on a 30 caliber. You'll have big problems. Yes. Um, but once we thread this on, so you can see the internal threading that's going to go on your, right. your your barrel. We'll thread that on just like this. And then once we've got this in the orientation we need, we can actually do this. This timing nut will actually reverse against the shoulder of the barrel and we'll actually put pressure on this. So we would have like a wrench on here holding these flats. Right. And we would actually back this off. And it will actually tighten against the shoulder of the barrel, which is cool because it's, it's almost, it's really, it doesn't require any gunsmithing, but yeah. it, but also gives you kind of a custom fit, right? I was going to, I'm not even like super familiar with these and like seeing you do that, that's what I was going to say. It's like, it's almost like a very easy to do version of, yep. you know, this guy where it was. This is actually self, this is called a self-timing muzzle brake. Um. The uh, the other one that I really like. What was it, what'd you call this one again? This one this one was. Uh, it would be like more of a custom gunsmithing fit. Um, but the other one I really like is this. I, I mentioned it before, but this Area Four One Nine. Um, so they actually have a system with uh, a device that's actually going to go on your muzzle. It's going to thread onto your barrel. Okay. And um, I'm kicking myself for not bringing it. But it's it's a, just a little nipple, so it's just a plug that goes on the end, goes around the outside diameter, <clears throat> and then it's a taper fit. So what a taper fit will allow this to do is self center okay. over the mount. So once we once we put that nipple on the end of the gun, we would actually just take this, press it on, and then we would tighten this nut. It's actually a reverse thread, so we would tighten that back on, and you're not seeing that move, right? It's not moving at all because this is actually just free floating onto the outside of the comp. There is a shoulder in there uh, and an internal lock ring that hold this uh, timing nut on. But this one's really cool because you can take those adapter nipples Mm -hmm. and have them on multiple different guns so that I can take this brake, which is not an inexpensive piece of equipment, Mm -hmm. and I can move this from rifle to rifle. The other thing I can do is I can have... um, different suppressors that use that attachment system. So if, okay. if I want to run a brake, I can run a brake, tighten the brake on, take it off, take my suppressor, thread it onto that same adapter. Interesting. So that's another cool attachment. Seems uh, pretty method. versatile. And, yeah, and it does, you know. it does require you to buy a small uh, 
adapter nipple that will go on the end of the gun that you would just leave on. Right. Um, Which but, I I'm, I assume you could just shoot it without anything on yep, it too. Yeah. You could if you're if you were going to do that, you might just you might take well. it off. Yeah. Um, or do just a direct thread. Um, but that being said, you know it's kind of nice. Like think think you want to take your competition rifle out. You want to shoot it somewhere. Um, you would have and if practice. you put that thing on there. You would have no reason to not use the brake or the suppressor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you know, think you want to practice somewhere, and you don't want to make a lot of noise. So you can take that same, that take the brake off, thread the suppressor on, um, and you you may have a point of impact shift from changing muzzle devices. But at least we didn't have to like strip everything off and retime uh, a more complex system. Right. Uh, we can just pop it back on, tighten it on. Uh, and if you get on that system, it's kind of cool because you'll find that, like myself, uh, you end up spending a lot of a lot of extra money on uh, muzzle devices because it's just so easy. <laughs> <laughs> you, think you make you friends with the people at the company. Yeah, you, you would think you're like, oh, I saved money because I can just swap this thing around and yeah. I'm not buying as many brakes, but then you just... But the alternative to that is a brake like this that direct threads and has to be timed to your barrel. So would you rather buy four of these for four different rifles at, you know, anywhere from two to four hundred dollars? Or would you rather buy a, a couple of fifty dollar adapter plugs and then have one of these and move it to the rifle you need? Yeah. So it, it all depends on what you want. It's not as custom of a fit. It doesn't look as like custom finished. Right. But it's really easy, especially after a couple thousand rounds and you want to take it off and clean it uh or you know a lot of these guys shoot the barrel out um a common common thing in in prs with six millimeters is you know 1500 2000 rounds somewhere in there uh guys are switching barrels a few times a year and if you're having a custom break time to each one of those barrels that's just a lot of hassle so it, it eliminates that step yeah for sure but yeah i digress there's a lot of uh different attachment and timing methods with muzzle brakes but um, yeah. What about the direction of, like, okay, here's where I'm trying to go with this. Like, there's a difference between, like, sound, like, so, you know, you're diverting those gases, right? Yep. But there's also a difference between sound and then, like, almost like the concussion, I guess, that's coming off sure. the brake, like, like or decibels versus, like, something else that you might perceive as noise. But yeah. do you know where I'm going? I mean, maybe I'm not being very clear there. But, like, okay, extreme example. We've shot the that Barrett 50 that, that we've had yeah. in Vortex forever, right? Yep. It kicks up a lot of dust and things like that. But that's not necessarily sound, but you're still experiencing something. Yeah, it's a muzzle blast. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of comps and brakes... I would say specifically brakes more, um, and one, ones that are designed to reduce recoil as their main purpose, the shooter doesn't necessarily experience much louder of a gun. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's not necessarily to the shooter, but the people off to the side, like in an indoor range especially, or if you're under a covered shooting oh. area, um, you're just like, you're like cursing the guy's name as he's shooting and you're just feeling that noise and concussion hit you. I mean, I um, just I know I've been at the range where, you know, like I said, I don't shoot brake rifles that often. And then, you know, somebody strolls up and you just look over like, oh, I'm in for it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And, and like that, I see that illustrated, too. in like um, my uh, my 2011 that I that I shoot primarily in open division has just top ports. Right. So it's a, it's right. a comp. Uh, but there's you, you see them where they have side ports and that noise to when I'm standing over here and somebody's shooting. If they just have top ports, like, it's not that bad. But if those they have side ports, like, you're getting that noise, and it's loud. Um, the same can be said about, like, just a traditional flash hider on a gun, on an AR. I mean, you would swear they're two different guns, two different ammos, but it's just a muzzle device. Just a difference in where that blast, that concussion, and those gases are going. It's also kind of what's being done with them. Like, a, a, a brake is using those. You can see the shapes... <clears throat> of those baffles, they're redirecting gases mm-hmm. and and kind of using them to your advantage. But that that concussion coming off the gun, if you're at a match and you have a bunch of shooters on the line, the last thing you want to be is right next to their muzzle because that's just like talk about going home with a headache that night. It's not mm-hmm. pleasant. Um, so 
that's kind of, you know, that leads me into like some of these things that kind of mitigate some of the, the negative effects. So like, let's say you've got an AR, you're running an ASR break. This one's for silencer co, uh, uh, suppressors. Um, they have a blast diverter, which is going to take and redirect. So instead of that coming off of there like that to me and you, right. We're redirecting it forward. Um, and so it's uh, kind of going out and then forward. Yeah. yeah. And so, but the thing to note is that you do lose some of that recoil mitigation because we, we are, you're still trapping it to some, we're degree. still trapping it. We're kind of changing what the gases are doing because if, if this was actually an optimal situation, we would just shoot like this all the time. Uh, but you know, you know, if you're shooting like, uh, in a, in a live shoot house or something like that, or you're, you're doing training and there's people next to you, um, you know, kind of like down at edge, we've got a bunch of shooters on the line and everybody's shooting at, in the same direction, but we're only a few feet apart. Um, with a muzzle brake like this, people are going to be pretty, <laughs> they're going to feel it. Yeah. Um, so that would be kind of somewhere where you might, you might see something like that used. Um, this one again, like I said, was from silencer code. This one is from hooks works. Um, so this is their, their flash hider. Okay. Um, uh, you can shoot the gun with this. Um, it works as a flash hider. This is their kind of their blast diverter, uh, cover. So I know it looks like a little suppressor, but it's not, it doesn't change the sound signature. Uh, doesn't change the decibels. It just redirects that. I was really hoping you were going to say it was some sort of cool workaround where <laughs> it kind of acts like a suppressor, at least a little bit. <laughs> Uh, maybe to the people next to you, it doesn't sound as loud yeah. uh, and they don't get that gas in the face, but, uh, but no, it doesn't actually have any, any baffles that reduce the signature or the sound, um, just redirection, right? So just misdirection, <laughs> it's like magic. Yeah. So those, those are kind of a couple of things that are pretty neat. You primarily see those on like, um, gas guns or ARs, mm -hmm. you know, car carbines, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that, that kind of stuff exists too. There's, there's a, a bunch of different ones of those on the market for different, different suppressors, uh, different muzzle brake, you know, adapters. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think, I think that like when you kind of ask a question about like, you know, what's the difference? Like one's pushing gas out this way. One's pushing gas out this way. If like we had to put it in a nutshell, the primary function of a compensator is to kind of mitigate muzzle rise mm -hmm. and, and the muzzle moving in you know, in directions we don't want it to. Um, and a break would be primarily recoil, can, recoil mitigation. And then we get into some of the devices that kind of do a little bit of both. Yeah. What's, uh, what's going on with the, this one with the ports Yeah. in, so, the, in the front? So this like one, you got obviously the, you know, the exit for the bullet, you know, yep. but then you got a bunch. So I will say this, I didn't design any of these, um, but this one comes from Seekins. And so this is their ATC. Um, you really mis misled people for a, you know, 32 minutes here, Ruben. Sorry, that's my bad. I won't do it again. <laughs> um, this kind of has some of these linear holes. Yeah. And uh, now they've got they've obviously designed this with a pretty big um, internal. You can see that internal blast chamber is yeah. pretty big. It's bored out inside. Okay. Uh, and mm -hmm. then you have your 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 um, ports here, mm -hmm. um, your brake. So they probably determined the amount of flow going out of this system and determined that uh, as that gas is coming out, now I'm guessing, sorry if I'm wrong on this, but by redirecting some of those gases forward, mm -hmm. they're probably interrupting gas as it's coming out to the side. Okay. And so that's something you see with some, like what's called like a linear, linear muzzle brake or a linear compensator. They're actually redirecting some of those gases forward through their baffles of the brake mm -hmm. that are interrupting gases. Okay. And so a lot of the angles and, that you and see. And those interrupting gases, the effect of those would be. It would probably re redirect. Okay. So that it's not all coming out to the shooter or to the people next to them, okay. but redirecting it forward while still maintaining some of the benefits of what that device was intended to okay. do. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm picking up at your lane. Now, yeah. Right? So you, when you look at like, um, I think I can't remember the name of the company, but there there was a really popular linear. Uh, it might have been done through DPMS years ago, but there was like a linear comp that sometimes you'd see people using. Um, <clears throat> did like it did the job of keeping the muzzle flat, reducing a little bit of recoil, but also not pushing that concussion out to the side. Right. Uh, which you know a lot of people that's 
that's their shooting experience is going to a flat range with people on the right and left and there might not be you know big nice bulletproof glass next to them rediverting you know redirecting that gas and the, that noise so y you can you can get some dirty looks pretty quick if you run yeah. one of these or one of these on the range at which is why i know i mean you guys shoot suppressed a lot too i mean we're yeah. talking about brakes here but like whenever you roll up and somebody's got a suppressor you're just like oh i love this guy yeah and i'm oh, not yeah. that guy like i'm the worst you know what i mean i come up i don't have one you know um, I'm, I feel sometimes I feel like I'm a little bit of a missionary for the suppressor industry because that's just so nice. Like from the hunting aspect to, you know, just general plinking, suppressors are not, are great. And getting people involved in shooting, you know, it takes away the big loud explosion that happens in front of your face when you pull the trigger. Because um, a lot of recoil, I think if you took, uh, if you took the same rifle and you shot it with a brake, with a bare muzzle, and with a suppressor and you just told people to shoot it and tell me which one recoils the most, they would probably they would probably tell you that the suppressed rifle recoils less and is quieter and is less right. disruptive, even though maybe they all have similar recoil. Mm -hmm. But that big explosion right in front of your face, uh, it, it like accentuates and emphasizes what's going on, and it just makes the whole kind of the whole yeah. equation more loud and disruptive. Uh, but yeah, suppressors, man. But you don't see a lot of suppressors at like at a lot of these matches for a few reasons. Um, you know, if we're talking three gun matches, if I'm shooting a suppressor and I've got you know forty round rifle course, you know, like uh, section of the stage, suppressor is going to heat up, and then when I go and put that in the barrel, it's going to melt down in the bottom of the bottom of the barrel. Um, ask Adam Maxwell how we know that. Uh, <laughs> but, or setting it on a table, you know, it's going right. to melt into the, to the carpet or the plastic on the table. Um, also you're going to get a lot of mirage off of the suppressor on a high round count stage because that suppressor is just heating up and it's just kicking mirage up right in your face, disrupting your, you know, kind of your, your view of the target. Um, well, and also in like a lot of those environments, you don't have people like directly to your right and left yeah you know you don't you are are uh prepared and equipped with optimal hearing protection so it's like yeah, a, there's, there's a not, pretty controlled environment where there's not many people going like oh i wish you would have told me this was going to be loud right you know, it's like everything <laughs> we do is loud <laughs> like, right sorry uh, it's kind of one of the fun parts but like um, even in like you know a hunting scenario or something like that where like you and I creep over a hill and you're on the gun and I'm like, you know, on the binos like, okay, cool, you know, range, well, okay, he's at 450, like, and I'm trying to watch for the impact, maybe because of the situation, which happens to me a lot, even though I shouldn't uh, promote this, like, sometimes I don't, I in. didn't put ears in, right? And so that's where it's nice, like, if you, you know, which again, guilty as charged because I don't always yeah. do it, but, uh well, and, you know, suppressors great. like just like just like muzzle brakes, like the noise or the concussion can be a downside. Like a muzzle a muzzle brake, that's I would say primarily the thing is like the noise and concussion because of the advantage is it's keeping you on target. Mm -hmm. Like especially in a precision application like that, that muzzle brake or any of these like precision muzzle brakes, I'm not just like watching to see if I hit the target. I'm watching where I hit on the target. Or if I missed, I want to know exactly how much I missed because mm -hmm. then I'm using my reticle to measure, you know. <clears throat> and, and, and in a lot of cases, like, I, I never realized this until, like, probably really, like, my third or fourth, like, precision match. Uh, I remember when I started seeing the trace through the scope. Mm -hmm. Instead of just seeing the splash or the impact, you start seeing the trace through the scope and you're, like, watching that round. And I'm, I'm like, probably the least skilled PRS guy uh, when it comes to all the guys here that shoot. Um, but there's, it's really cool when you get the right, the right round, you have the right muzzle device, the right brake, and it's tuned for your system. And then you start seeing that round walk into the target. It's so cool. But right. you wouldn't do that with a suppressor necessarily because that thing's main purpose is to keep the gun quieter. It's not to keep it flat while you're shooting. Right. Even the ones that do have a little break at the end of it, you know, that, the Area 419 Maverick is a pretty cool suppressor because it does have, like, uh, a portion of it that's a suppressor and then a portion of it at the end that uses some of those gases to re-divert that oh, muzzle direction. So it does it does act as a brake and a, and a suppressor at the same time. But even if we look and add up all those 
pros, they're still bigger and heavier than a brake usually, mm-hmm. right? The suppressor is still going to be bulkier. And then not mm-hmm. to mention, you know, your time and time and tax stamp and stuff like that. All that. Yeah. I know uh, when Jim and I did that uh, PRS science experiment, you know, where we, mm. you know, went to our first PR- PRS match, which apparently was like, that was like a pretty high level. We probably shouldn't have been at that match, Ruben. But I did get to see some really good shooters with some really um, high speed equipment designed for that task. And like you said, I mean, from the uh, um, from you know the muzzle device that they chose to how heavy the gun was to like, I mean, you watched the guys that were super dialed and you know, shooting those, you know, little baby six millimeters. If there wasn't, like, gases coming out the muzzle, you wouldn't know they shot. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Like, I mean, you, you the gun didn't move. Mm-hmm. It did not move. And Like, and, it was amazing. And you were used to going to the range and watching from a spotting scope, watching somebody, and you see the trace, right? Yeah. That's what those guys are doing through the gun they're shooting. Exactly. But you have to get the gun tuned with the right load, with the right muzzle device so that it does. And those guns are heavier too, typically, yep. right? Uh, but, but yeah, they're getting kind of that same v- view that you're seeing through the spotter through their rifle scope, which wouldn't happen if it wasn't all a tuned specific setup. Um, so that's what's cool is I, I think like going to a match like that, if I had the choice of going to like a local match where there's – you know, a handful of shooters and you spend a few hours on a Saturday or go into a big match for a couple of days, uh, the amount of stuff that you'll learn going and getting thrown in the deep end uh, is is crazy compared to just shooting like a one-day match. Yeah. Because you do get that multiple days. Like you're there for a little bit of time. You're in that learning mode. We just uh, shot USPSA Open Nationals. It was uh, Race Gun Nationals, so it was open and limited. And we shot with a... One of our uh, brand ambassadors, Varric, who is, he hasn't really shot much USPSA, but shot a lot of like three gun and, and okay. that kind of stuff. Um, he's done a couple of team sniper challenges. And this is so open nationals. It's like the Super Bowl of, of USPSA. And, and it was three days of shooting, you know, seven to eight stages a day around the range for long hours. And he was like, oh, I really probably shouldn't have done this match for my first big match. And I was like, Dude, you get three days in a row shooting a few hundred rounds a day. That's a good learning experience. If you can check your expectations at the door, go learn at one of those those events because you are you are there with the best of the best, too. Right. So right. talk about watching people and picking up on what some of those guys are doing. Yeah, that's a cool place to do it. Yeah, I think in something like that, I almost wonder. I mean, there's no substitute for doing Right. Yeah. So that's the tricky part. But going to like a high level match like that or the one that Jim and I went to, like, I think if you just watched, you know, picked three people that you're like, okay, these are the three people that I'm really going to watch. You could glean a lot from it and take that back with you. And sometimes I wonder, would I have learned more? No. You would, I, it would almost, it would be interesting to do it both ways. One where you, do it and obviously observe and kind of see what's up. But also you're kind of like distracted by thinking about what yeah. you're trying to do. Yeah. We're getting off topic here. That's all right. But being able I got a good segue back to focus back on just to be able to focus on other people and then, you know, interpret what they're doing, extrapolate that and then apply it later. You yeah. know, I don't know. And in a lot of the competition scenes like that, you know, you, you are seeing gear that's in a very specific role. You, you right. are seeing it's sp- totally specialized. Yep, exactly. And and like as much as this and this is specialized for a PRS rifle, as much as these are specialized for like a three gun rifle, I'm looking at your rifle over here and that's got like the smallest muzzle device of all these things. I mean, it's like the size of a, like one of these crush washers. Um, so you've got on your, your Weatherby, you've got like a, a unidirectional muzzle brake. That's something that's really common to see on, like, these lightweight hunting rifles. So, and that's what I was going to say. When I think of, you know, when I first became aware of muzzle brakes, Mm -hmm. like, what is on this rifle to me is kind of like the quintessential classic hunting rifle. Yeah, I think of, like, your old, uh, your old, um, 
able with uh, that boss system on it, right? That's the BAR that has the boss. Oh, the on BAR. It. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But which I do like same brand. Um, yes, exactly. Same yeah. same brand, same Same system. church, different then, pew. <laughs> exactly. Um but yeah, very. I mean, it's just got holes all the way around. You know, yeah. that boss has got a little. You know, because it's like a, have a tuning system, a tuning yep. system on it, the, the ballistic optimizing shooting system. There you go. Uh, but also like one that I ended up. You know, be, um, I think early on, I thought that because I had an auto loader, like I probably should always shoot all the rounds in the auto loader because you know why be able to shoot that fast and just a couple instances shooting that rifle in different scenarios where you're, you know, ripping all five uh, in fairly rapid succession, like, left me with some permanent hearing damage that oh, I yeah. think would... Correct me if I'm wrong, me, but I feel like it was enhanced versus if I was just shooting, like, a non braked rifle. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think even, like, I've shot <coughs> muzzle brakes like this before. Um, I think this would be more of, like, a compensator. Um, but... <coughs> But yeah, I've shot them with and without them, and yeah, there's a there's a difference. Um, I think the biggest thing that you're not going to get with that like omnidirectional porting is you're not necessarily going to get the ability to well tune any of it, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not going to it's not going to direct more of the gases upward to keep your muzzle flat, but it is venting off a lot of that gas, and some of it you can tell due to the angle that those ports are cut, it is angling it back. So it is probably doing a, a considerable amount for for recoil mitigation, but as far as muzzle rise, it's probably not doing anything in one direction more than any of the other directions. Right. You know what I mean? It's um, yeah, yeah. I brought this one too. This one, this one's off of a Saco, um, and and yeah, it does it does help. Similar, a bit. right? Just kind of doing the same. Yep. And and especially you've got what does that rifle weigh in at? Five and a half, I think. Yeah. So like the. Uh, it's like the weights that guys put purposefully on their PRS rifle is what your rifle weighs. Right. Uh, <laughs> and so, and you're shooting, uh, what did you say that was chambered in? It's a it's a 6.5 RPM. Okay. It's kind of a cooking little round. So you're shooting like a 127 LRX or yep. something like that at 127 what LRX. I want to say, oh gosh, don't quote me, I should know this. Um, like it's got to be over three. I think it's like right? 3180 or something yeah. like that. So, it's right about there. Yeah, so and that's like a 24-inch barrel, it looks like, 22, 24. Um, so I've got a 6.5 PRC, and I shoot the 140s at, uh, I think it's like 3080 or 3100. That's a serious, yeah, that's fast. Yeah. And that's not a little amount of recoil. It's it's like in that short mag family. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. Probably not as sharp, but, but yeah. So on a five and a half pound rifle, you absolutely probably want something, especially for practicing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to get time, and that's we kind of kicked it off with that. Like, if you're shooting a rifle that's enjoyable to shoot, you're probably going to shoot it more. Um, kind of funny this time of year, we get <coughs> a handful of rifles that uh, need to get sighted in, and uh, we usually draw straws for the seven mags and the three hundred <laughs> rounds. <laughs> 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 I'm not saying that Tucker's had to do most of them, but yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, you don't need a 300 now. Now I'm the king of saying you're never going to make something too dead. However, when you're just chasing good old white tails in Wisconsin, yeah, there probably, there is a certain yeah. amount of uh, overkill that maybe isn't necessary. Well, I think it's just and it goes back to what we started off earlier too, like a lighter recoiling gun is generally you're going to shoot it better. So, like, if you could oh, yeah. hit the woods or the field or something that well, you're you going to shoot better, you're going to come home with You're you know, not going to only game. shoot it better. You're going to shoot it more. Right. You know, that's that's Which probably, is part of shooting better. That's probably why you shoot it better yeah. is because you shoot it more and you're getting reps with it. Uh, but, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a that's something that, like, I, I really like that about suppressed rifles is that, like, I'm just going to shoot it more. Right. Like, from not bugging the neighbors as much to not having people's dogs barking as much because <laughs> you're shooting um, to just like just concussion and sound and like just the overall shooting experience. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to shoot a suppressed gun more. It's a nicer um, experience. It's a more pleasant experience. Yeah. Um, all the way down to, I mean, everything from center fire rifles to shooting 22s. Like 
when we do some of the product trainings with suppressed 22s, you know, inside of 300 yards, like we don't, we're not like wearing hearing protection. We still wear eyes, but like half the time you can't even hear when it goes off. Like, cause these precision, like suppressed 22s are so quiet. Like, um, and obviously like if you're going to do that, check your own setup and make sure that it is, you know, hearing safe. But like with our setups that we have, um, start with the hearing protection on. So yeah, start see how <laughs> it feels. But for our setups, it's just it's yeah. it's negligible. Well, and talk uh, about. I mean, you're talking about you know training rifles. You can train everything with a system like that, and you're talking about doing all the long range stuff inside of 300 yards. You don't need the room. You don't have the concussion. You don't have the noise. You don't have the recoil. You don't have the ammo expense. I well, mean, that kind of goes to prove the point. Like if it's easier to shoot and it's more enjoyable to shoot, you're going to do it more. Right. Uh, and you learn the concepts, you drill the concepts in, and you do it. Repetition, then all of a sudden you get out in that situation, and it probably doesn't matter if you have a muzzle break on this gun because right. everything has been learned. Your your everything from your form to you know just getting that good natural point of aim, getting lined up on the target correctly. Um, that's something that I've noticed in in hunting and like my hunting. That's just um, it's become like second nature, but a lot of it is because I do shoot more with more enjoyable shooting rifles. I don't shoot a lot of 300 wind mags and seven mags and short mags. It's just not fun. And for more, for most stuff, you probably don't have to. Yeah. You know, well, accuracy, if we're talking an accurate rifle versus an inaccurate rifle that's more powerful or delivers more energy on target. Like, unless the target we're shooting has a specific uh, needed amount of energy or a required, you know, amount of energy for penetration or for, you know, bone, um, I'm going to shoot the more accurate rifle every right. day of the week. Um, and that's just because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to place that bullet where it needs to go so much better. And then, like you said, there's certain scenarios where, you, hey, you need a little more gas. You need a bigger bullet. Yeah. Um, you need those things for, it could be the animal itself, it could be the distances you're engaging, it could, whatever, you know, could yeah. be. But don't, you know, don't necessarily take that rifle uh, and try and force learning the fundamentals of shooting on a, on a rifle that's beating you up every time. Uh, and if you do, and if that's the case you're in and you want to shoot that gun more and you have the ability to do so, even with ammo, you know, uh, cost and Look at a muzzle brake. Get a muzzle brake on it. You're probably going to have to double up on hearing protection. Right. Uh, you know, the people at the range, you might you might not make them the happiest, but you know what? You're getting time behind the gun. It's not beating you up as much. You're learning things like follow through and watching, you know, calling your shot and stuff like that. And that's that's really, I think, what a lot of these things do for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. They are handy. They are effective. They serve their purpose. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. What about accuracy? Can, the, can a muzzle brake increase or decrease the oh, accuracy man. of a rifle now no. i was about to close it out then i had another oh, question man. yeah so i think um so I'll, so i'll answer this a couple of different ways and you can you and listeners can kind of make your own conclusion but i've i've the last year or so i've played with a muzzle tuner okay uh, right. i think i got uh we did a podcast yeah on so tuners. i think i have the ats tuner it's not a tuner what is it? <laughs> is that what the podcast was called? No. <laughs> uh, uh, but so I've played with a tuner and the tuners, uh, some of them shift forward and back where the mass is, mm -hmm. you know, there'll be a weight that shifts mass forward and back. Um, some of it's around the d muzzle where it, where it actually like places mass, but it's, it's a tuner. It's a muzzle tuner changes mm -hmm. harmonics of the rifle. Right. I've had rifles that I've shot and I've put a muzzle brake on it and seemingly shot better okay was that because the gun shot flatter oh boy was it because it changed the harmonics because i put something different on the end of the barrel like i put a five ounce piece of steel on the end of the barrel was it was it i, I mean i don't know was it both it could be both i've had people who have said they put a muzzle device on a rifle and it shot worse and we took it apart and looked at it, and they were having baffle strikes on the on the comp or on you know on the brake, okay. because their shoulder or where their muzzle was cut wasn't cut you know perfectly perpendicular to the bore. So they're having baffle strikes, which change their accuracy. 
Um, but you know, I've heard like made it better, made it worse, didn't change. Um, I think one thing you can plan for is you're probably going to have a point of impact shift because okay. you, you, well, number one, you are hanging a weight off the end of the gun. So if anything, you're going to be a little bit different. The other thing is that due to like some of the designs, they create turbulence to interrupt That's gases. what I was going to ask. Is there some sort of disruption to, like you said, turbulence? Like, yeah, exactly, right? I think that most high-speed footage would probably show that that bullet is gone before a lot of that happens. Okay. However, I'm not saying that's the case with all of them. It could be one way or the other. It could be that that as that bullet's leaving, it's uh, the gas interruption is changing how that, that drag is, you know, acting on the bullet or the, the drag is affecting the bullet. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not, you know, a fluid dynamics uh, engineer, uh, but I can tell you that you probably will have a point of impact shift at which point re-zero the gun, enter that data in your ballistic solver, or um, <coughs> re-verify, you know, if you're running a certain type of reticle, a you know, BDC reticle or something, just re-verify that everything checks out. Um, check your group sizes. You know, yeah. if you're going to put, uh, if you're going to put a muzzle device on a gun, um, you know, make sure if it's shooting, if it's not shooting good, you know, go down and look at the target, see if any of those bullets are coming into the target sideways. <laughs> like, uh, if you do, you know, if you do have you know, some sort of baffle strike that can interrupt the flight of the bullet, you can, you know, I've walked up on targets and seen the side profile of a bullet because it was impacting a baffle or something like that. Um, I one time uh, didn't get a muzzle loader bullet seated all the way, and I was like, oh, that's an interesting hole in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I've even, I've even, I think on my first AR, um, it was it was a nine twist, and I thought it was going to shoot everything great. And the seventy five grain bullets I was shooting on it were like hitting sideways. No kidding. Yeah, man. yeah, a couple hundred yards. Um, Interesting. Which at that point is amazing that they were even hitting the target. But then you just look at it and you're like, oh, well, I have, I have a nine twist. I should probably stay under sixty eight grain bullets or something like that. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> that wasn't muzzle device's fault. That was my fault for not being uh, informed on that. But as far as accuracy, I think it's probably pretty pretty specific. If you put one of these on a rifle and it changed the accuracy for the better, and you told somebody, hey, I bought this, it made my gun more accurate, if somebody else has a different setup, it might make theirs less accurate. I, I'm not sure. You know, mm -hmm. It could be unique. Like if it's changing the, the harmonics of the whole system, maybe it benefited one one barrel profile and length combination and another one it it you know was the opposite yeah uh but either and way like you said then it's hard to ferret out you know if it's making you shoot the rifle better you know if you're performing better with the rifle yep so i don't know uh the, those results will probably be unique to each person but results will vary uh, <laughs> i can tell you that the shooting experience will be better if you're looking for a flatter shooting gun you're looking to reduce recoil um you know going with a, a break or a comp is gonna gonna do the desired effect but yeah it's got to be the right setup for you probably wouldn't you probably wouldn't want something like this on a lightweight hunting rifle no right right that'd be out of place on you know yeah. what i have in front of us here and right at home on a different system. exactly yeah yep. so again it goes what what are you what are you going to use it for you know how do you want and, and what do you want it to do absolutely like, what's the what's what is the desired effect what does this have to do for you? Pick the right one. Ask some people who shoot them frequently. Uh, you can ask us. Um, you know, we're always happy to Call give vortex. opinions. Yeah, I mean, talk muzzle brakes all day. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, wouldn't be the weirdest thing we've talked about. So No, no. I'm sure it's something we've talked about many times, actually. Yep. So. Um, well, cool, Rube. Thanks for bringing all these in. Thanks for chatting through this. Um yeah, it's it's an interesting topic, fun topic, you know, a topic that, you know, might be able to help shooters out there yeah, shoot better, for sure. you know, maybe answer some questions, hopefully answer some questions. That's what that's why we podcast. So, oh, thanks thanks to you, thanks to everybody for listening. Yeah. Do you have any more muzzle break questions? Uh, let us know. And until then, shoot straight. We'll catch you on the next one. Yeah. Thanks guys.
There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.